Yes, I, I'm, I'm very grateful that I have the opportunity to, to somehow conclude uh, on the topic I have uh, touched uh, yesterday. So uh, I think, yes, there is a new discourse uh, emerging which uh, has a potential to go uh, beyond the, uh, well, the uh, petroleum case, you know, going beyond petroleum, this was once an advertisement of BP. And one can also turn it into, you know, what's happening recently, at least in Europe, I would say. But maybe, uh, but I know it also from countries in Asia, that these green growth promises are quite familiar for a lot of people. And uh, that it seems to be that it's, well, a pathway between these fossil uh, uh, main road already touched uh, by the first presenters uh, today and, well, that's what uh, most of us will hope for, would hope for, namely uh, a socio-ecological turnaround. But, you know, what I've yesterday touched on is, you know, why these green growth promises um, are so, well, welcomed by a lot of people. It has to do with the fact that these are win-win promises. So uh, it's, a, it, it's a promise that actually nobody has to sacrifice anything and that everybody can win. And therefore, well, it's very attractive for a lot of uh, uh, actors, including civil society organizations, governments, in particular in industrialized countries, but also international organizations, academics of various fields. However, as I have argued yesterday, uh, optimism about uh, uh, well, uh, upcoming decarbonization of the economy should be tempted since there are a number of constraints uh, and um, these constraints really are calling into question whether the green economy hopes can be fulfilled. Um, I would like to refer in a very brief way first to technological constraints, constraints of the market structure, financial constraints and finally a hint to the most important, namely systemic constraints of the capitalist system as such. Uh, before I will address at least some of the problems um, uh, which we already all, all would be faced in case we would really start turning beyond capitalism, also beyond a green capitalism, and I guess Elmer uh, can then very nicely continue with his views as far as I know these. Um, uh, so, first let me summarize. There are technological constraints coming up uh, why a green economy promise, whether we call it green growth or green capitalism, really cannot succeed. First argument I have given yesterday refers to the rebound effect. So uh, this is the argument that when we use technological advances in order to increase um, the efficiency of all our procedures and thus using less raw materials and even also emitting less CO2, thus damaging less the environment, that, the, that, we, that we can really escape the traps we are in. The point is, that usually in capitalism, increases of efficiency always result in turning money into other fields. So the households will buy other stuff uh, when they save some money because uh, their fridge is now uh, 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 working more efficiently and the companies will invest in other fields. With the final result will be growth eating up efficiency gains. You know, this is what we know from history and as there's no reason to assume this is, will be different in the next future. There are two other hints which are referring to more technological constraints of green capitalism. Uh, the second argument would be what we really need actually are quantum leap changes in a very short period of time. Quantum leap means, you know, some people have calculated this, if we really would build our hope on technological advances, we would need to have a technological change between 10 and 15 times quicker 
than all what we have experienced during the last 30 years. And if you imagine how quick technological change was during the last 30 years, and then assume that it should be within the next 30 years, 10, 15 times quicker, uh, it seems to be somehow impossible. Uh, and what I also have addressed to you yesterday are the numerous challenges linked to renewable energy technologies. The main argument was that due to the fact that uh, renewable energy technologies have a very low EROI energy return on energy uh, invested. Um, actually, it is less competitive compared to fossil energy as long as you uh, let the market do the job and you have in parallel fossil energy uh, 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 facilities as well as renewable one. The brown one will always win because their infrastructure is existing, assets are in this uh, area, and it's very, very difficult to shift these assets around. So uh, what will be the outcome, and we can see it very, very well in Europe recently, yes, we have an increase in renewable energy uh, provided, um, but the point is it's only used for, uh, for the additional uh, uh, demand coming up. If you have it in parallel, so there is not a decrease recently in fossil fuel uh, uh, um, um, uh, consumption, but you have uh, renewables adding up uh, uh, so that, well, it's, uh, that you can do with the same amount of oil and gas, uh, but it's not really that renewables have a chance if you let the market do the job. My, uh, the second conclusion from what I have touched on yesterday would be that we have also uh, uh, market structure uh, taken into account as a constraint. So we all know that the big uh, energy companies are dominating the scene everywhere in, in Mexico as well as in, in Germany where I'm coming from. Uh, and they are able to force government, uh, but not only governments, also trade unions, also workers are under heavy influence of these big uh, energy cooperation, and therefore uh, we have to take this into account. First, second argument would be uh, it's so easy still to externalize the cost. So we know all, you know, that Europe, for instance, yes, it decreased its emission, but only due to the, to the effect that we, via importing stuff from across the world, you know, we let other countries do the dirty jobs. So we have, in the meantime, the cleaner industries in Europe, while the other are producing the stuff we are consuming. So actually, CO2 emissions are appearing somewhere else in, uh, in a huge amount than in Europe, for instance. So this is uh, one uh, example for externalizing costs of these kind of, uh, while well, still dominated brown uh, uh, stuff. Uh, uh, further, uh, these big corporations uh, and also the industries who are depending on fossil fuel, uh, very, very successful uh, uh, organized that they are subsidized in one way or the other, be it via direct subsidies uh, in a lot of countries who are, uh, where poor people are dependent on fuel subsidies or by it in a more indirect way as we have it in Europe, then it goes via research and development and things like that. But still, uh, the influence is quite heavy. And if it, if it, within capitalism, part of the ex internalization of the so-called externalities is started, as it was a case or is a case with the emission trading scheme, we all know that windfall profits for, produ for polluters will appear and will not uh, change the whole story. So in addition to these technological constraints and market structure constraints, referring to these green growth uh, uh, hopes, uh, we have to take financial constraints into account. So um, we all know actors on the financial market, these are the ones uh, who enforce a lot of pressure on productive capital to generate surplus value. Uh, um, so, and the only way to do this is to expand production. So if you have these pressure from the financial market, even if you would like uh, being a, a philanthropist, being a nice, good capitalist, uh, you cannot change, uh, uh, turn around 
uh, um, uh, 100% because you have to expand your production, uh, otherwise you cannot uh, generate surplus value. Plus, the financial actors, as we know, are, have very short-term interest in profit profitability and invested capital. And, you know, as I told you, renewable energy technology for the in the present and in the nearest future, they will be more expensive than the brown ones. There's no question. So uh, financial and investors, they are looking for short-term returns. And if, you know, even if it can be demonstrated, and it has been demonstrated, that in the long run, it will be much more uh, uh, successful also for financial investors to turn to renewable energy, well, in the short run, it will not. And this is the reason why they stay with what they have. Uh, and the last argument would be, well, they are risk adverse uh, uh, as a principle. You know, they, they prefer to incremental change and these turnaround, these 100% turnaround which we would need uh, is nothing you can do with financial investors. And in addition, I would say, well, the current debt uh, crisis in the mean, uh, well, actually exp uh, uh, experienced so much in Europe, but obviously it will come back to Latin America, so I guess Brazil is already at the, at the brink of uh, facing the, net, uh, the next debt crisis. Um, well, with a debt, uh, with, with, a, with a heavy debt burden uh, on the government, you cannot expect that they um, find themselves uh, within this budgetary straitjacket where they are, uh, uh, able to launch, uh, let's say, a big economic stimulus package as has been done by some countries, US, Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, in 2008 in order to uh, uh, react on the financial crisis. Uh, so, um, in addition to, let, summarizing these three elements or these three type of constraints, I would say, okay, um, again, I have to be quicker, I would say, well, um, we have grave consequences of energy scarcity, which yesterday I have said, which parallels with metal scarcity, and this will, metal scarcity will even increase energy scarcity. Uh, so, and I have already said technology alone will not solve our problems. And yes, you know, on a, let's say, pragmatic, on a pragmatic level, we can say, and this is always, always said, well, we would need longer product lifetime uh, we would need recycling, we would need reuse of materials, we will need stockpiling. All this is necessary, but actually I think this will not bring out uh, uh, what is necessary, namely a contraction of economic activity which would be necessary in order to realize our collective goal of sustainability. And the most important constraints, obviously, are those which are systemic, in capitalism. So constant accumulation of capital is inherent, uh, has an inherent expansionist feature and economic agents are forced to undercut the costs of others, of their competitors, or they have to conquer markets by creating new products. And this leads under all conditions always to uh, more physical production and consumption. Um, therefore, I think it's obviously that we have to move beyond capitalism, also beyond what is called green capitalism, but we cannot expect uh, that a voluntarily shrinking of the economy, as it is, for instance, recommended by uh, people from the post-growth movement in Europe so much, that this will appear. So instead, what I think definitely we have to talk about and discuss about, I would like to discuss about this, is that the political ecological um, paradigms are calling for more fundamental changes. Um, and in particular, the predominant growth-oriented development uh, paradigm uh, um, obviously has to be challenged. Uh, secondly, um, we would need to broaden social ecological transformation uh, and this would include operating as well on a local as on a global scale. We cannot do the one without the other. Uh, this would include a lot of issues which, well, it would be great to discuss about this, what it needs. Well, it needs that we promote climate jobs. This is something else than simply green jobs. 
It needs democratization of the economy. It needs better distribution of income and wealth. It needs power over markets. And definitely it needs a, a culture of sufficiency. But it's also clear that win-win constellation will be uh, not possible. This place, obviously, so somebody will lose, and we have to face the constellation. Who will be losers? Um, and those who are supposed to lose, uh, they unfortunately have the power to fight back. And therefore, um, we have to uh, uh, discuss, I guess, uh, will, with, 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 with some uh, with some rationality, but also not with, without giving up us our hopes, what it really would mean to drastically retrench or even shut down a number of industries which simply cannot stay. And this is not only the fossil fuel industry. It's a car industry. It's a cement industry. Uh, it's at least part of the chemical industry, and obviously, it's a banking sector. Uh, so, when I give this, you know, we immediately would run into the question, you know, which government across the world will change the challenge, face the challenge to uh, afford these kind of powers? Uh, last argument would be that, well, if you would really take a green road beyond capitalism, um, this would also create numerous conflicts between progressive movements. Uh, let's be, uh, let us be uh, serious about this. So some will be prepared to compromise with major business concerns and with state power, arguing, well, we cannot do it against them. We have to work together with them in order to make some, some change happening. And others will emphasize collective action and self-agency as a major point. I think there is no really a wall between these two types of progressive movements. Uh, we simply do not know uh, whether what might com commence as a modest demand for local reforms would finally or could finally turn into something like a broad anti-systemic revolt. Anyway, um, if I would have more time, I would have uh, uh, addressed the, the challenges in the, in, the, in the concrete steps which have to be taken. And then we would see, yes, uh, there is always a chance, you know, that the one thing would be disaster and collapse, and the other road maybe, uh, no, the other road definitely uh, is full of conflict and will take quite long in order to bring us beyond capitalism, but I think there is no alternative. Uh, for this, uh, and uh, well, in order to stay somehow in, in the time limit, I have uh, five minutes, so then uh, that's great. Um, then I can at least um, give you one example, um, you know, um, uh, in terms of, you know, what would be needed. Um, it's, it's sure, you know, if, what I, if, 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 if one is serious, you know, closing down industries, shrinking industries, not, 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 on the, not in a sudden, but, you know, step by step. This will mean growth anyway, well, we have discussed growth anywhere is not increasing that much, but this will reduce growth further. And reducing growth further would also mean having less revenue uh, government can spend. Nevertheless, when we touch on these green issues, we see we would need a lot of government uh, investments in infrastructure, a lot of infrastructure, um, and you know, to give you one uh, dimension in terms of numbers, Public investment in infrastructure uh, in Europe, in, in Germany, in Germany was around uh, uh, 70 to 20 percent in the 70s and the 80s. Today it's down to 7 percent. What Jürgen Randers, one of the authors of the Limits to Growth study, has calculated what would be needed in order to uh, 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 to face the damages climate change is causing everywhere, but also to rebuild these new infrastructure, to refit cities, to bring up public transport system, and all this stuff we need. We can go uh, hours for this to describe what would be needed. We would need to increase public infrastructure spending to at least 
well, 30, 30, uh, um, uh, 37 to 40 percent, which is nearly a doubling compared to the periods in the 80s. And this translates into something very simple. We, can, we need more so-called collective consumption, so you know where government is spending, but we are depending on these uh, services which are provided, or we can have more individual consumption. Well, uh, it would be, uh, so uh, this is a chance uh, on the one hand, because we need this type of investment, but on the other hand, well, you have to convince not only the very rich, uh, but you have also to convince the, well, the growing middle classes uh, uh, in Mexico, in Germany, that they will have less individual income to spend for their consumer habits. And, you know, one can go on and on uh, and, you know, uh, for instance, this nice idea, well, we will uh, do more recycling. Yes, it's good, but the, the problem with the metals I have discussed uh, uh, yesterday is that s some of these metals actually have a recycling rate of w around 1%. If you double it and qu qu quadruple it, you still have so low recycling rates. So yes, the only step would be to force, let's say, the Apple or all the other equipments, uh, the providers of these nice equipments, that they do their construction, their design in a way that you can easily dismantle it and you know, get access to the resources. But this would mean interfering in private public, uh, in public ownership. So there is no way out of, you know, putting the property question into the center. I uh, finish with this.